the dean of the race school. Other one looks like Scott Syracuse, the guy who was in that accident in New York a couple of years ago and almost died. Someone was saying they're here to scout for extra candidates for the race school. No way. Jason eyed the two visitors strolling through the VIP tent with Randolph Hardy. The older man was indeed Jean-Pierre Leclerc, principal of the International Race School, the most prestigious racing school in the world. Located in Tasmania, an enormous island at the bottom of Australia that was wholly owned by the race school, it was more a qualifying school than a strictly teaching institution. While lessons were certainly taught there, it was your ranking in the school championship ladder that really mattered. It was that ranking that got you a contract with a pro racing team after your year at the school. Not surprisingly, the race school had produced nearly half of the drivers currently on the pro circuit. Leclerc was a regal-looking fellow, with a perfectly groomed mane of white hair and an imperious bearing. His suit looked expensive. Jason figured it probably cost more than his entire car did. The man beside Leclerc was far younger, in his early thirties. He was sort of handsome, with intense features and impenetrable black eyes. He also walked with a cane, and looked like he'd rather be at the dentist having root canal therapy than be here at the Indo-Pacific Regional Championships. Jason recognized him instantly. He had the man's collector card in his bedroom back home. He was Scott J. Syracuse, otherwise known as the Scythe, one of the best racers ever to have helmed a hover car until he busted the neurotransmitters in his brain in a horrific crash at the New York Masters three years ago. These days, modern medicine could fix just about any broken bone in your body, even a busted spine. But the one thing man hadn't figured out was how to fix the human brain. If you busted your brain, your racing career was over, as the Scythe had found out. Just then, Syracuse turned, and his ice-cool eyes locked on Jason. Jason froze, caught staring. A full second too late, he looked away. Truth be told, he actually felt embarrassed under Syracuse's glare. All the other drivers here wore coordinated outfits that matched the color schemes of their cars. Some even had the new Shoei helmets. Others still had full pit crews wearing their team's colors. Jason and the Bug, on the other hand, wore denim overalls and their dusty farm boots. They raced in old motorcycle helmets. Jason scowled. He could hide his eyes, but he couldn't hide his clothes. He also couldn't hide his hover car from Syracuse's level gaze, but that was another story. The Argonaut, car number 55. It was Jason's pride and joy, and he spent every spare minute he had working on it. It was an old Ferrari Pro F1 conversion that he'd found in a junkyard four years ago. One of those early hover cars converted from old Formula One cars. It had the bullet-shaped body of an old F1 car, complete with nose wing, hunchbacked fuselage, and wide tail rudder, but with the added features of a navigator's seat tucked immediately behind the driver's cockpit and a pair of swept-back wings stretching out from its flanks. Most incongruously for an old F1 car, however, it had no wheels. Hover technology, the six shiny silver discs on its underbelly called magneto drives, had made wheels unnecessary. While he liked to think otherwise, Jason knew it wasn't a real Ferrari Pro F1 only the chassis. The rest of it was a hodgepodge of machinery and spare parts that Jason had scrounged from farm vehicles in the local wreckers yard. Even its six race quality magneto drives, a mix of GM, Boeing and BMW mags, were second hand. Despite its eclectic innards, the Argonaut's exterior was beautiful. It was painted blue, white and silver in a way that accentuated the car's fighter jet-like shape. Jason himself was 14 years old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and determined. At school, he was good at math, geography, and game theory. He wore his sandy blonde hair in a messy Mohican style, reminiscent of the retired English footballer David Beckham. 
At 14, he was also rather young to be at the regional championships. Most of the other drivers at this level of racing were 17 or 18. But Jason had finished in the top three in his district trials just like the rest of them, which meant he had as much right to be here as they did. With him as his navigator was the bug, his brother, and at 12, even younger. With his tiny body and his big, thick-lensed glasses, the bug confounded a lot of people. He didn't talk much. In fact, the only people he would speak to were Jason and their mother, and even then, only in a whisper. Some of the doctors said that the bug was borderline autistic. It explained his excessive shyness and social awkwardness, while also explaining his mathematical genius. The bug could tell you what 653 times 354 was in two seconds, which made him the perfect navigator in a hovercar race. The Carpentaria race was a gate race. The most famous gate race in the world was the London Underground Run, a fiendishly complex race through the tunnels of the London Underground system. And the Carpentaria race was based on the same principle. Instead of doing laps around a track, a gate race had no actual track at all. Rather, it took place over a wide area of open terrain, 600 kilometers wide by 600 kilometers long. In today's case, that terrain was the vast swampland on the edge of Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria, a marshy landscape that featured a labyrinthine network of narrow waterways cutting through the swamp's eight-foot-high reed fields and the high coastal sandbars of the Gulf itself. Positioned at various points around this maze of natural canals were approximately 250 bridge-like arches through which the racers drove their hover cars. As your car whizzed through a gate arch, an electronic tag attached to your nose wing recorded the pass. Passing through a gate gave you points. Gates further away from the start-finish line were worth more, those that were closer, less. The furthest gate from the start-finish line, for example, was worth a hundred points, the nearest ten points. The trick was there was a strict time limit. You had three hours to race through as many gates as you could and then get back to the start-finish line. This final element was crucial. Every second that you were late coming back cost you one point. So coming home just a minute over the three-hour mark would cost you a massive 60 points. The driver with the most points won, which made it a tactical race in which navigators played a key role. No driver, no matter how skilled or fast, could get through all the gates in the allotted time, which meant choosing which gates to go for within that time limit. And since computer navigation programs were strictly forbidden at all levels of hovercar racing, having a good navigator was crucial. Add to that pit stops. Magneto drives overheated, coolant tanks needed to be refilled, compressed air thrusters had to be replaced, and all the many vagaries of racing, and you had a serious strategy contest on your hands. The Argonauts screamed across the marshland, rushing through a narrow alleyway flanked by walls of eight-foot-high reeds, kicking up a whitewash of skanky swamp water behind it. 610 kilometers an hour, 620, 630. With his steering fins flapping uselessly inside his broken rear spoiler, Jason steered with his two rear thrusters instead, alternating left and right, incredibly using his pedals to control the speeding bullet that was his hovercar. The bug had plotted their course well. Every trip to the pits allowed Jason to see the big electronic leaderboard mounted above the main grandstand with its up-to-the-second tally of all the racers' accumulated scores so far. Driver. One. Becker B. Number, 09. Car, Devil's Chariot. Points, 1,110. 2. Richards J. 24. Stormbreaker. 1,090. 3. Tajik E. 19. San Antonio. 1,010. 4. U E. 888. Lantern 4. One